Well, guys, I'm so excited to begin our podcast, The Other Six. This is fantastic. My name is Chad. I'm the creative pastor here at Vaughn Forest Church. Uh, joining me today is my co-host, uh, Matt Collins, our worship pastor. Matt, how you doing? Hey, guys. Doing, doing well? I'm doing great, man. This is awesome. Yeah. And uh, and our guest today, as will be our guest most, most <laughs> days on this podcast, uh, our lead pastor, Adam Bishop. Adam, how are you, sir? I'm great. I'm just thrilled to be between two <laughs> such brilliant minds. This is fantastic. Oh, you're so nice. <laughs> That's right. But we're so excited to be kicking off this podcast. Obviously, this is our first one, and we're excited to be offering uh, this discipleship, this encouragement, uh, not just on Sunday, but the other six days of the week. That's why yeah. we're calling it the, the other, other six. six. That's right. So Matt, tell me, what are you most excited about with this podcast? I am excited, obviously, to sit down with you two guys. I mean, it's going to be incredible. Um, I think the thing that I'm really excited about, though, is that we get to kind of slow down everything. Because mm-hmm. Sunday, like, I mean, you only got like 35 minutes to get your thoughts out there. And like some of the times when we're going through content, I'm like, man, I, I really want you to elaborate on that point. Right. Like that was gold. And so um, I'm excited about that. And then again, again obviously, obviously to sit down with you two. Awesome dudes. Yeah, I think it's cool to think about everything we do on a Sunday, whether it's in our worship services, kids ministry, student ministry, life groups. There's value in that. We we talk about that all the time. You know, when you get with God's people, the value. I think what's exciting about this is then making it a both and. So there's value on the day. And then there's value in the other six. Now, I wanted to go with the other five, but you guys told me, no, it's six, Adam. <laughs> That's right. So I'm glad we got all six days. So I, how do you make it a both and? We, we take what we do and, and we incorporate it into our walk with the Lord the other six days of the week. And yeah. hopefully this time in here helps facilitate that process. And yeah. uh, that's our yeah. goal. So we'll yeah. see how it goes. I, yeah. I had somebody tell me, they thought we called it the other six because it was the other six pastors on the staff. And I was like, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <They're> all- <laughs> they, they are much more observant than I yeah, am. I, was like, I, I wouldn't have put those I two I did not together. put that together at all. Yeah. But I mean, hey. Yeah, but, you know, it's exciting to me that we're going to get to do this. Obviously, we saw, you know, nobody ever wants to think back to the lockdown time. But when we were doing our daily devotions, folks really engaged and really enjoyed that. And so being able to offer this as kind of a, a, a non-anxiety version of that, uh, but just being able to really encourage folks throughout the week. And, and you know, uh, this past, so not this past Sunday, but the one before that, we kicked off this new message series, Functionally Dysfunctional. And obviously we're having a little bit of fun with the title, uh, but it's really all about family and relationships. So Adam, you know, when we were planning this, what was just kind of the general idea behind the series Functionally Dysfunctional? I think in family, it's easy to point the finger. So uh, if my <laughs> wife would walk with the Lord, our marriage would be oh, better. You oh. know, if my husband would get his act together, our marriage <laughs> right, would be better. Right. So in family, we're always looking to blame. And it's easy because you know the people in your family best. So you right. see all of their flaws. So the idea of the series is, you know, God created family. But since sin ent- entered the world, interestingly enough, through a family, it has disrupted and created dysfunction in every family sense. Mm-hmm. So we're all functioning in dysfunction because of sin. Right. So when you right-size that, what it does is instead of my spouse being the enemy, sin is the enemy. Right. The author mm-hmm. of sin is the enemy, the father of lies. And so if you can try to at least help people see that up top, maybe at least gives them a fighting chance in their family <laughs> right? <laughs> because now you're unified against a, com- a common enemy. And then doing that in the context of a church family reminds us none of us are trying to do this on our own. So we're just trying to go through this a week at a time and uh, see what God's word can say about that in very practical situations. Right. Uh, either marriage, parenting, blended family, you know, just kind of running from one week to the next. Now you said something interesting just there. You, you kind of compared, you talked about how we have our families, but then also kind of the broader church family and how these same uh, lessons kind of apply. I've never thought about that, that, you know, as we have our nuclear family, you know, mom, dad, kids, uh, grandparents, you know, however you want to look at it, we also, as a church family, kind of function in the same way. So I think that's very interesting that the same lessons that we're applying to our families apply to the church family as a whole. Yeah. So that's really good. All right, well, I, I kind of want to dive in. So this past Sunday, we talked about parenting and some grandparenting, and not just parenting small kids, but also parenting teenagers, parenting adults. And uh, I loved the uh, all the different perspective. I remember when uh, you told me you said there's going to be nine points. and we <laughs> <laughs> Normally you don't have nine points. Normally it's not both sides of the notes, but I thought there were so many 
points, uh, they were really, really good. And and we moved it, really quickly moved through it. moved really quickly through them. And so. so I'm grateful that we have this opportunity to kind of slow down and kind of dive into it. So the first thing I want to ask you about, you said this uh, pretty early on in your message. You said that culture trumps vision, that culture trumps vision. What did you mean by that? When you say that culture trumps vision, what is culture, what is vision, and how does the culture trump the vision? Yeah, so in, in terms of family, right. um, everybody has this goal, dream, aspiration, picture, whatever word you want to use, of what their family should look like, what they want it to look like. Um, I don't think it's difficult to look at kids and, and see hope for their future. Right. You know, we certainly do that with our own kids, and obviously in the context of church, we do that with the next generation. I think what's challenging is what we do in our home makes or breaks that. Mm -hmm. So you got a family who, man, I want my kids to grow up and love Jesus. I want them to be involved in the church. I want them to understand how important it is to do things God's way, but they never go to church on Sunday. They never make sure, they always make sure they hit every deadline for every other little league sport. They always make sure they get everything else. But when it comes to church, it's a, if we can work it into our schedule, we'll be there. That's culture. So mm-hmm. what those kids grow up seeing is aspiration to have God as a part of our life, but in reality, not really part of our life. It's the Bible on the shelf that never gets opened in the evenings. Mm-hmm. It's the family that says, we live by the good book. They just never bother to open it with their kids. Right. So you can say what you want, what you do will trump what, trump what you want. Well, wow. so yeah. so saying this is what we want to do versus what we actually do. That's yeah. the whole idea behind culture and trumping vision. All right. I got you. That's Very awesome. Yeah. Um, you also talked about keeping your kids, um, safe, but allowing them to experience discomfort. Um, what, how do you ride that line between practicing that and keeping them safe, but not letting them feel neglected? Um, how, like, how would you do that as a parent? I mean, I'm, I'm talking like I have kids, but I, I don't. So. Yeah. And so, you know, there, there's going to be some seasonal components to that, yeah. depending on the, the age of the kid. The, the actual yeah. kid. Um, I probably should have clarified a little bit more in the point, which maybe that's why this is, you know, one of the things that can be <laughs> helpful right. for us in here. Um, primarily, I was thinking about that as it pertains to the consequences from their actions. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, you know, a kid does something, it gets them in trouble. Um, and we think, yeah, I don't know if the punishment should really be that severe. Yeah. Maybe it's at school, maybe it's at church. Mm-hmm. But if he did something that brought about some consequence, like let him let him experience a little bit of the consequence. Yeah. Don't don't step in and, and protect him from the consequence. Um, the other thing there I would say is th- there's got to be a check in, in in my heart as a dad. Anytime my kid's telling me something, am my first and foremost listening in a way where I'm trying to see that as an opportunity to connect him to the heart of God? Yeah. And I'm using the pronoun him because I got three boys. So I'm talking about this, you know, from that perspective, but this is the same if you've got daughters. So Sam or Jacob or Henry, they're telling me something. Sam, you know, maybe let's say a couple years ago, Sam told me about a kid was picking on him at school. Mm-hmm. So as he's talking, intuitively, all I'm thinking is, how can I get a hold of this kid's parent, right? <laughs> because I'm going to set him straight. You know, right. how, who, have you met Sam? <laughs> he's the he greatest at? kid in the world. Who yeah. would pick on Sam? I'll this take is, care of this. This is yeah, what I'm right. thinking, right? Wrong thing to think. Right. The, the right question is, all right, as I'm listening, is there an opportunity here to connect Sam to his true father, his heavenly father? So it's hard to teach kids to pray. So we pray about everything. So, so what I try to do is default to prayer. Mm-hmm. So as he's talking, he, he finishes up. I'm like, well, buddy, maybe that's something we should pray about. Yeah. Now, with young kids, the first thing they're going to say is, really? Because they've been told we pray about missionaries and, you know, church right. and, and other things. They don't know these are things you can pray about. So it's pretty powerful for a young kid to go, all right, well, I want to pray. Well, then what are we supposed to pray? Well, Jesus said we're supposed to pray for our enemies. So are we going to call him an enemy? Um, so we get to have that conversation. <laughs> are we going to pray for him? Do we know what's going on in his life? Yeah. Tell me what else you know about this kid. So now at this point, we've moved past the initial challenge, which was I'm getting picked on, to an opportunity to actually do what Jesus told us to do, which is pray for one another and pray for our enemies and pray yeah. for the, those who persecute us. That is not my natural inclination as a parent. Yeah. My natural inclination as a parent is to protect him from that conversation ever happening. Yeah. Right. But if I don't okay. see this as a gospel opportunity to show him the power of prayer, the power of Jesus, I've missed an opportunity there. Now, having said that, there's always a line. 
Right. Yeah. yeah. So if, if if any of our kids, you know, their, their safety is really being placed in jeopardy, if the adults aren't being the adults, then the adults need to be the adults. There's a right way to handle things where you're respectful and, and yeah. you're, you know, and kind and all of those things. But I think what I was just trying to go for there is in, in every initial conversation, if there's a way to connect them to God, because ultimately you're not going to be around, mm-hmm. you know. Right. Yeah. So you're trying to develop in them a, at least the the option that they begin to think down the road, okay, this is happening again. The last time it happened, I was instructed I should pray about this. Now when I'm on my own, I'm going to take the time to pray yeah. about it. And then obviously, if you have to step in to provide guidance and all of that, you can. So, so we're not trying to knowingly send our kids into tumultuous situations, but when they face them, yeah. how we guide them through that, I think matters. Yeah, more of a discipleship yeah. approach. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's really good. Yeah, because the world is out there. And, you know, we, our job, you know, you talked about this quite a bit yesterday, this idea of being kind of stewards and how, you know, how we want to parent our kids in such a way so that when they are grown up, we can A, you know, be their friend. You know, we're not, we're, we're not called to be their friend right now. We're called to be their parent. But then also that we can, uh, but ultimately we are their brother or sister in Christ. Yeah. And so, and again, I think this kind of goes back to that first thing we talked about, this whole idea of, when you, you know, when Sam comes home and he's telling you about this kid, you are demonstrating the idea of culture. You know, you are setting the culture of we pray for our enemies. We, we, uh, we're going to, we're going to go out. And even though this kid has been messing with you, we're still going to pray for him and we're going to do the right thing. Uh, but I think, you know, you mentioned that line, sometimes knowing where that line is can be tough. And I think, I know my default as the dad of two girls if anybody messes with my girls, I mean, those are, oh, man. yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm getting, you know, I want to jump in. <laughs> Fired up. I want to be the, the warrior, the rescuer that's yeah. coming after it. And, and it's important to be, to remind parents that, that you, you got to ask probing questions. Right. Yeah. Cause sometimes it's like, yeah, I don't think that's that big <laughs> that's of a right. deal, but then other times it's legit. Right. Yeah. And, and we need more adults, whether it's teachers, coaches, pa- parents, engaging kids in proactive conversations right. so that, so that we can figure that out. Right. So, um, I, and I'll tell you this, I mean, typically those conversations come at the times where I'm most exhausted. Right. <laughs> so again, you know, full disclosure, I don't, I don't want to have that. You know, I, I want to chill. I want to decompress from my day. And the challenge of parenting is when you walk through the door, that's when your day starts. That's right. Yeah. So we've yeah. all put in a full day at work mm-hmm. and then we walk in the door at home, we're ready to decompress. Well, that's the two to three hour window we get with our kids. Right. So how do you prepare for that? How do you get energized for that? How do you walk in ready to serve there? Right. How do you walk in ready to listen there? This is Holy Spirit work. So I have all kind of goofy routines, and one of which is what I do on my way home every day. Because you recognize if I don't prepare for this supernaturally, I will disengage it. Right. Mm-hmm. So now you're the, pres- you're the parent who's present without being present. Mm. And your kids pick up on that. And again, that's culture. Right. That's culture. Mm. My, you know, my parents tell me they're always there for me until I need to talk to them about something and then they're exhausted. That's right. culture. So we have to spiritually even prepare ourselves for those things. Mm. Yeah. And you said that's Holy Spirit work. So that's, it's even beyond, you know, scripture talks about how like we have to look to Jesus to be our strength, look to the Holy Spirit. Like, and that's what you're talking about. Like it, it's almost a supernatural kind of thing. So what, what are some things that you do to, to do that? I mean, how do you, how do you prepare yourself to walk through that door after you've given so much of yourself at work and be prepared to give even more than what you actually have at home. So I have a theological conviction that grounds me that I would share as an encouragement to everyone else. And it's so simple (laughs) that people are going to be like, really, you're, you're that smart. Um, (laughs) so (laughs) it's the reminder that God is already where I'm about to be. Mm. And I like that. Yeah. So, I'm on my way home. God is omnipresent. He's already there. He's already familiar with the emotions that are in my home, the conversations that have been happening in my home, the day that my kids have had that I know nothing about yet. And so what I'm asking him to do is to give me a sensitivity to enter into his presence where he's already been. Right. And what I have found is that when I pray that prayer and I ask for an alignment and a sensitivity, it doesn't mean that I always get it right. Right. But it at least means I'm trying to tune in my heart to joining God and what he's already been up to instead of this idea that once I get home, now God shows up, which is not the right way of saying that. But I think as Christians, so many times we we have that subconscious 
thought process that's that's counterproductive. Right. So God's already there. He's already present. He's already been at work. Help me to be intuitive enough to sense what's happening when I walk in. Because whether it's our, our, our wives or our kids or anyone in our family, what's being unsaid is sometimes more important than what's being said. Wow. Mm. Sometimes there's a vibe in the room. There's a spirit in the air. There's body language communicating. Yeah. And if we're in tune with the spirit, I think sometimes God gives us insight. Like we talk about from James, you ask God to give you his wisdom and he, <clears throat> he'll give it to you. Sometimes he gives it to us in interesting ways that, that, right. that and I'll speak as a guy because I am one, that, uh, that require us to be a little more perceptive than we naturally are. Right. Which anytime you run into something that you naturally can't do well, this is why God gave us the Holy Spirit. Hmm. We don't get to fall back on an excuse, well, I don't do that well. It's not my gift. That's not my skill. That's why God gave you the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can supply what you are perfectly incapable of supplying on your own. So you're trying to sync up with that. Right. It might be a five-minute prayer. It might be a 10-minute prayer. It might be a 30-second prayer, okay? But you're at least going into this acknowledging, I don't want to walk into this on my own strength and energy. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a great segue into my next question for you. You mentioned a phrase uh, that I never heard yesterday, situational parenting. <laughs> and uh, and I really... I really it was of... situational ethics, but Matt corrected me before the service. <laughs> really right? grateful, Matt. Yeah, so thank you're, you for yeah. that. Welcome. You're welcome. Yeah, so obviously we... we uh, we're not promoting situational no, ethics. No, no. Our know? worship right. pastor keeps us theologically right. grounded. Matt We're does grateful a great for job that. that. Thank you, Matt. That's you're right. welcome. Well, well done, Anytime. sir. Anytime. Uh, but this whole idea of situational parenting, and and even with what you're talking about there, you're talking about different situations. Can you expound a little bit for me on this idea of situational parenting? Like, what does it mean, and how really can we use that as a tool as parents in our arsenal of raising these kids? All right. So here's my answer. It's probably not very popular, or or uh, it might even get me in trouble. But I think it's <laughs> we, we I like think it's answers. a good philosophy <laughs> as a parent to have very few convictions. Okay. So God's word is very clear on some things. Right. And then there's quite a bit of things it's just not very clear right. on, right? <laughs> so if God's word is clear on it, that falls into the conviction category. Right. So let's just kind of set that one aside, okay? But there's a lot of other things in our lives that quite simply are just preferences. Right. But here's what we have a tendency to do turn them into principles. Hmm. Because it sounds a lot better to stand on a principle <laughs> than to stand <laughs> on a preference, right? Right. So apply that to parenting. We all have very strong beliefs, convictions, ideals about how things should be done. What happens when that bumps up into a uh, difference in one of your kids? Hmm. Hmm. And I used the example of school yesterday because I think it's the easiest example to right. use. But if parents can begin to think that way, but and here's why I use that example. I've been a pastor for 21 years. I've had a bunch of conversations over the years. I was a student pastor for years. I was a college pastor for years. I've lived in three different time zones in America. So I've had a few conversations, <laughs> all right? Here's one of the ones that drives me crazy. When I ask parents uh, something about schooling for their kids and their response is what they did as a kid. Right. Uh, <laughs> I don't care. Right. <laughs> And neither should they. Right. But like, it's like, well, where are they going to go to school this year? Well, I was homeschooled as a kid. Cool. That has zero to do with the, the, you answering the question I just yeah, asked not, you. Not what I asked. Yeah. But that's what they do. Right. Do you know who else does that? Me. Right. Someone asked me a question about my kids earlier on. Well, I grew up going to public schools. We all do it. Right. The moment someone asks us about our kid, we answer our experience when we were kids. Right. As if that's helpful. It's not. <laughs> What's helpful is learning your own children because you may have had a fantastic experience at public school. You may have one of your kids that the public school that they would go to, it may not be the best situation for that child. And you've got to be willing to let go of that paradigm, that conviction, that belief that, you know, this is how we do it for the good of that child. Mm -hmm. That's situational parenting. It's, you know, well, I always believe kids should never quit. My kids aren't quitters. If they start something, they're going to finish it. Be right. careful. Right. Be careful with that because they may get into something that they need to quit. <laughs> and if you've said, we Sorry. never quit in this house, what if you've tied your hands. Right. Yeah. So that's all I'm trying to say is it's so easy as a parent to be rigid, mm. but sometimes that rigidity is actually counterproductive to what we're trying to do in our kids. Right. Yeah. And, I'm, and, and the reason why I put that in the notes is it's for me. Mm. I am a very passionate person who has very strong opinions. Right. And if I'm not careful, 
those opinions will form more of my philosophy of parenting Sam, Jacob, and Henry than what's best for Sam, Jacob, and Henry. Mm-hmm. And this is where Morgan's been such a blessing to me. She's a blessing in so many ways, but I'm <clears throat> grateful at times in our parenting where she has, you know, said, listen, I, I think you're off there because you're speaking more from what works for you. I'm not sure that's necessarily what's going to work for them. Really helpful advice, really helpful parenting. And that's why parenting is a partnership. You need both, you know, seeking the Lord. And, but, but that's kind of what I'm going for there. Yeah. It's this the idea. world is completely different now. And so it's what applied to us when we were younger doesn't necessarily apply now. And yeah. you need to be careful. Yeah, the, the I would you never. Right. You have to be real careful about yeah, that. I got you. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, I think we got time for one more question. I, I right? think we do, man. Okay. We got all kind of time. You stay all- here all day. <laughs> Sweet. I'm glad. So, um, this message series, I think uh, there's a lot of parents that are going through. It's like I'm in this season now. What um, What are some w- things that a young professional or um, a college person? What are some practices or things that they can apply to their lives now that they could take from that message from yesterday? Um, you know, like D and I, like D's a teacher. What are, uh, can she ap- apply some of that stuff in the classroom? Um, and I'm sure we got a lot of teachers that are, you know, wondering that as well. Like, right. how can I, how can I come alongside the parents? Um, how can I take this and not, you know, for me, like I don't have a kid, so how do I apply that to my current situation? Yeah, I think whoever wants the next generation the most is going to get them. Mm. Mm. If it's the church, we'll get them. If it's uh, another entity in our society, they'll get them. So anybody that's a part of a church family, um, I believe you have a responsibility to make sure that every kid, teenager that you come in contact with knows that that they matter and you're glad they're there. Mm. Um, I love seeing kids run in church. It's one of my favorite things in the world because I grew up in a church where I was told, don't run in church, it's God's house. And I just never could understand that. Because I thought running was fun, yeah. right? And, I, and fun. I was like, I, do it every day. I didn't know God lived here. They should at least repaint the building if God lives here. That was what I would think sometimes, <laughs> right? But um, I realize now how theologically inaccurate that was, but right. it was used as a controlling mechanism for yeah. a young, hyperactive kid like myself, yeah. right? So when I see kids running around Vaughn Forest Church, I'm like, go faster, yeah, right. sprint harder, yeah. go tag that kid and make him yeah. it. So what we're trying to do is, again, culture mm-hmm. here at a church where kids understand this is where you need to be. This is where we want you to be. We want to have a line item in our budget for repairing holes in the walls caused by kids. We want to have a weekly complaint from a parent because somebody in their kid's class said something inappropriate because heaven forbid, we got lost kids showing up at church on Sunday. Mm -hmm. We want teenagers when they walk through the lobby to be called by name by pastors and senior adults. We're trying to create a culture where the next generation knows they matter here. Mm -hmm. So whether you're a teacher, whether you're a parent, whether you're a senior adult, whether you're just a member of On Force Church, that's what we're going for. Because in every situation, kids and teenagers are asking do I matter and does anyone notice? Yeah. That's what they're asking. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of people out there who will answer those things. And my desire for our church is that we answer that faster than anyone else. And we help those kids and teenagers know, like, this is a safe place for you to just be. Mm. You, you don't have to put on a show. You don't have to put on a front. You don't have to have it all together. We're going to love you and accept you just the way you are. And we're going to do that in the context of a family because, again, for a lot of these kids— they're not going to see that type of family modeled well at home. Right. This yeah. is why the family of God matters so much. And so, yeah, we talked specifically about parenting yesterday, but Chad, you said it early on in the conversation, many of the things we talk about in parenting also apply to the family of God right. as well as how, yeah. we, as how we treat one another. That's good. Well, I think that's a good point to kind of kind of end yeah. this podcast. Adam, thank you so much for being Man, here. Yeah. Uh, I, I love the discussion. I'm really looking forward to this Sunday. And, uh, and we'll be back again next week uh, with this podcast. We'll continue the discussion. And uh, let me thank Matt, my co-host. Thank you for being here today. You're welcome. Thanks, Adam, Chad. <laughs> yeah, Adam, thanks for being here as our guest. Appreciate you guys. Uh, on behalf of Matt and Adam, my name is Chad. Thanks for joining us. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. See ya.